Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing anemia of chronic disease, one of the causes of non-hemolytic normocytic anemia. Now, don't forget, on our YouTube channel, YouTube forward slash Mad Medicine, you can go and check out all of our Hemonc videos because we have made it. We have made a Hemonc playlist for step one, so go and check it out there. And while you're there, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. It'll really help us out. We post brand new videos for you guys every single day as far as step one is concerned. So let's talk about normocytic anemia. This is what normocytic anemia looks like. The red blood cell is going to be normal, and it is classified by an MCV that is going to be 80 to 100. Okay, this is a normal mean corpuscular volume for a red blood cell, so therefore we are classifying this as normocytic anemia. Now, this normocytic anemia can be subdivided based off of hemolysis uh, and uh, non-hemolysis, and the non-hemolysis, sorry, the hemolysis can be even further subdivided based off of intrinsic and extrinsic causes of hemolysis. So in this video, we are talking about a non-hemolytic anemia, anemia of chronic disease. That's the topic today. That's the first one we are going to cover from now on. And for the next uh, several uh, videos, we are going to be talking about the non-hemolytic anemias. Now, one thing to remember, in not all non-hemolytic anemias, your reticulocyte count is going to be less than or equal to 2%. That is very important. The reason why is in these anemias, you are pretty much going to have a decrease in red blood cell production. That's all that is happening. You have a decrease in red blood cell production. Your bone marrow is not producing a lot of red blood cells. And because you have a decrease in red blood cell production, you are not producing a lot of reticulocyte reticulocytes that are going out into circulation. And therefore, your reticulocyte count is going to be less than 2%, aka normal. So you will have normal reticulocyte count in normocytic anemias. The way I like to think about it is a lot of things look normal in normocytic anemias. There are just a few things that are wrong that are happening. Now, and when it comes to anemia of chronic disease, this is a form of anemia that is associated with a state of a chronic disease that's happening. This could be endocarditis. This can be autoimmune conditions as well, like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and as well as cancer. And this is probably the most common, the most common type of anemia that occurs in hospitalized patients. Also, this is the most forgotten anemia, so don't forget that. A lot of people don't remember anemia of chronic disease, and that uh, diseases can lead to anemias as well because you don't have enough red blood cells that are circulating and providing enough oxygen to the body. And that's why you can have signs of anemia like lethargy and uh, getting tired easily as well. Just a generalized, um, uh, the B symptoms that can also occur with anemias. Now, when it comes to anemia of chronic disease, this is going to lead to a normocytic anemia, but it can also cause a microcytic anemia as well. So keep that in mind. For step one, you can mainly equate it to normocytic anemias. Microcytic anemias usually will not happen uh, um, for case presentation and as far as the vignettes are concerned for step one. Now, when it comes to uh, uh, anemia of chronic disease, you're going to have a very mild anemia that's occurring. So the hemoglobin is going to be less than 10, very mild, and it's going uh, to be rarely symptomatic. Okay, you're not going to see a lot of symptoms that are occurring, but you will notice when you do uh, a CBC that the hemoglobin is less than 10, you're looking at an anemia occurring. The patient isn't really going to show symptoms of severe anemia and uh, decreased oxygen to their body. Usually, this is all going to be driven by cytokines. Again, this is a chronic disease, and you are going to be producing a lot of cytokines, so you are going to lead to anemia. Now, this chronic disease is also going to produce acute phase reactants, and one of those acute phase reactants is going to be hepcidin. We talked about hepcidin in our iron videos, especially in iron deficiency anemia and uh, all the other ones, but hepcidin is a key regulator of the entry of iron into circulation, right? So it inhibits ferroportin. And if you guys recall, ferroportin is the uh, protein that allows for iron to go into our circulation from our gut. I think of ferroportin as a port for iron to go to when it wants to enter from the gut into the bloodstream. 
right? It's just a protein. It's not a channel. It is a protein, but it's a way of helping you guys uh, remember and simplifying it. So because it inhibits ferroportin, uh, hepcidin can act as an antibacterial and um, it can decrease the availability of iron available for bacteria to use. But at the same time, because you're inhibiting ferroportin, you're going to decrease uh, and iron, you're going to decrease iron absorption in the gut as well. And if you decrease iron absorption, you are going to have a state of iron deficiency anemia. And that's one way it can lead to uh, uh, a normal acidic anemia. Remember, early states of iron deficiency anemia, in the early stages are going to present as normal acidic anemia. And because you are not absorbing iron in the gut properly due to hepcidin, you will have an early stage of iron deficiency anemia as well as anemia of chronic disease. Now, hepcidin, one more thing to understand that a lot of people forget is that it also suppresses EPO erythropoietin. EPO is secreted by the kidneys and it stimulates the production of red blood cells. And because you are inhibiting EPO, you are going to have decrease in RBC production. So this will also uh, further cause a, a mild anemia to occur. Now, this mild anemia will also be supplemented with a mild decrease in the red blood cell survival. And one thing to remember is that if you give iron to patients who have anemia or chronic disease, they are not going to respond. The reason why is because you have hepcidin that is in higher levels, okay? And this higher levels of hepcidin is going to cause a decrease in ferroportin, and this decrease in ferroportin is not going to be uh, uh, changed. It's not going to be fixable by giving iron because that iron will not even be absorbed in the body to begin with. So that's why giving iron to patients who have iron uh, anemia of chronic disease is not going to be beneficial. Now, when it comes to lab findings on the CBC, you're going to see a normal acidic anemia for the most part. That's very common. You can also see a microcytic anemia where an MCV will be less than 80. That can also happen, especially if the anemia of chronic disease is leading to uh, a chronically depleted iron state where you have a iron deficiency anemia as well. And that, if it goes for a long time, if you have late stages of iron deficiency anemia, you will definitely have microcytic anemia occurring. So just keep that in mind. Now, the main thing to understand of anemia of chronic disease is that number one, you are going to have, uh, when it comes to your iron studies, is you're gonna have a decrease in your serum iron levels as well as an increase in your ferritin levels, in your ferritin levels. So the way I like to think about it is because you are pretty much in an iron depleted state, whether it is a pathogen that's occurring, whether it is cancer or you know whatever it may be happening, your body is not going to have that much iron in circulation. Keep in mind you have a hepcidin that's out there and hepcidin being, being in circulation is going to cause a decrease in serum iron. But at the same time, if, let's say if you have a chronic bacterial infection, uh, bacteria are going to require iron too. So that will also lead to a decrease in serum iron. Now your body is going to say, yo, this is not right. This should not be happening. I need to get more iron into my cells rather than the pathogen getting iron. So I'm going to increase ferritin. Ferritin, if you have an increase in ferritin, you are going to have more intracellular stores of iron. And in anemia of chronic disease, this is the hallmark iron uh, study finding that you will see. This is the main change that's happening. Okay. You will also see a decrease in total iron binding capacity or transferrin and you'll see a decrease in percent saturation. Now the free erythrocyte protoporphyrin levels will also be high. Why is that? Well, because you have a decrease in serum iron, you're not gonna be able to produce proper heme and uh, erythrocyte protoporphyrin levels will be high because you are not going uh, through with the last step in producing heme where protoporphyrin binds to heme, it binds to iron to produce heme. So you will also see a free erythrocyte protoporphyrin level in this state as well. So this is also very important. It's also pretty high yield. So the increased ferritin and the increase in free erythrocyte protoporphyrin should clue you into anemia of chronic disease along with some other condition that's also happening. Now the treatment for this is very simple. You are going to treat the underlying cause of the disease. If you treat the underlying cause, you will eradicate the anemia that is also occurring because of that 
disease. Now, this is, again, a secondary anemia. This is not occurring intrinsically. This is just happening because you have something else happening in the body that's leading to this anemia. And then with that being said, we have covered everything you need to know for step one, anemia of chronic disease. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel if you guys like what we are doing. New videos every single day. Our Instagram handle is right there, at, dot, at mad.medicine. And our Twitter handle is right here, at it's mad medicine. You can find these lectures on your favorite podcast service for free. Just search Mad Medicine and we'll pop up.